My farm is subject to five audits a year. We get Red Tractor, Soil Association, Welsh Assembly Governor and Arcade, and we've got a, as we're making cheese, we get another audit. All these audits are collecting data using not a common framework. So we're supplying the same information. I just pay these bloody auditors to come and mm. spend whole days on our farm collecting data. And at the end, we know nothing more about how to when we were more sustainable last year. And we can't compare all the different systems and most of them overlap anyway. So we, I say we, because a group of us, including um, Tim, uh, Dalesford, and uh, other farmers from a huge range of different backgrounds, uh, had a meeting actually originally, at the, the, the original uh, initiative came from Wadston, uh, which is the Rothschild estate in Buckinghamshire. And we sat around the table and we thought, we are the farmers and the land managers, we should look at this situation where these audits are overlapping and collecting our data and not making them useful to us. And think about how we can develop a harmonized framework for the annual data collection of all our farms and uh, produce and make sure that the data that we is being collected is possible to us to make the decision if you require scientists and uh, consultants to spend days and days collecting it. That's not sensible. In an ideal world, that data would provide DEFRA and the World Assembly Government to make decisions about how we could be rewarded for our soil, water, biodiversity, nutrient management, livestock management, stock management, social capital, natural capital. Um, and that data would then form the basis of a national inventory of data, which is multiple purposes. We use benchmarking, we use and we can manage myself against myself in a year by basis. I want to know whether my soil is better than last year or my biodiversity. I will talk to Tim or to Richard and say, what's your score for the Dales of biodiversity? Mine's X and yours is only Y. <laughs> <laughs> and this creates not only a national conversation, because we had the ambition to think that this needs to be an internationally harmonized framework for farm sustainability assessment. Two and a half years down the road, we've made fantastic progress. And Michael Go short actually at that uh, sustainable soil uh, issue, the first one, which is the left of 2017. Uh, we met Michael Go, we immediately agreed to come to the Wadsworth this day. And that started a conversation about uh, DEFRA using this framework for sustainability assessment for post Brexit, if there is post Brexit. Uh, I think the opportunity for this is incredible because this same scheme can be used for marketing and certification schemes. So, for instance, we're certified by the Soil Association. I would say to and I used to work for the Soil Association, I would say to the Soil Association, so don't come this year, here's my data. You make a decision on whether I'm organic or not, you can come with a good Same with Red Track. So, all these certification schemes are all using separate data and separate ways of inspecting we need to have the same common framework. And then the certification uh, with all that information, we then need to work out how we can uh, change the financial and economic uh, incentives and disincentives that DEFRA and the World Health Governments of the European Union uh, offer to farmers in this post-Brexit public money to come to this world. And the data that we were collecting that, we were able to make rational decisions about what needs to be rewarded and then measure the outcome of their incentives to see if they're working on a real year basis. And one of the schemes that we think would be the most important one to introduce would be to pay farmers for their soil carbon. Because if farmers increase their soil carbon, that's a, 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 a proxy for a lot of other benefits, a lot of benefits, not just in the soil but above the soil as well. And we come up with this framework of 10 categories, each of which has metrics which will capture the best, the most significant uh, outcomes of our farming system, and they're obviously subject to revision. Um, and we're trying now to work with many other organisations. As Rob just said, we've just been accepted as one of the trials and tests of the uh, DEFRA Helm scheme. And we're hoping to roll this um, framework up on 50 farms uh, throughout England. So that the farmers themselves can test the data to see if it works and say, if you take the soil carbon, as a very good example, how do you measure your soil carbon at the moment? You have to do four samples, which could be um, informed by satellite placings to improve, improve the accuracy. But it may be that 
new technology will come up and come along quite soon to enable soil carbon monitoring to become really really good. At which point we would say, well, move on to the new technology. So we need to have robust and reliable metrics for each of the categories. And then uh, Michael go to his successor and say, right, we're going to introduce the soil carbon um, stewardship scheme. And you're, you, you'll be paid not only to maintain your soil carbon, but to increase it as well. And we've been arguing, and this is a little bit of an edgy point, because we made this argument, we are going to come to some new things, which has already been referred to, that the lion's share of the £80 an acre, which we're all getting as far as the low level of common agriculture, obviously gets more or less licenses. Don't break the rules against money. We've been arguing that that money should be going into incentives to improve your sustainability for your farming, not stewardship schemes which are on the edge of otherwise intensively farmed land. Mm. And we, in fact, I, we have found ourselves on the losing side of an argument with most of the environmental NGOs who have been strongly arguing for stewardship for many years, and now we've got this great opportunity to switch the signal from pain into sustainable farming practice rather than peers coming around the edge of your farm like your section of the And we're finding we're experiencing resistance from the environmental and conservation NGOs. I think that that's because they've got used to the sort of psychology of thinking that conventional farming, the intensive kind of farming, is the norm. And therefore we have to protect what's left around the edges of preserve any biodiversity. And in fact, we now know that not only is that failed to arrest the decline in biodiversity, but actually it's put farmers in a straitjacket, which has perpetuated the type of farming systems which are based on intensive methods. So what we need to do, we all need to rise up together and do this. So the 80 pounds an acre, the single farm payment of pillar one, which is the lion's share of the money that I get as a farmer, needs to stay in farming and towards sustainable farming practice. Farms who don't farm sustain, we shouldn't get any. That's a very controversial thing to say. So let's just say there's not yet a complete call about that in the environmental energy of the community. So let's stop. Unless Tim thinks I've missed something else. No, I think you've done that in a practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very um, I think any questions uh, from the floor at this point? Mm -hmm. right. and can I just take some issue with that? Because I agree with pretty much everything you said particularly around the fact that farming has been uh, has been protected from paying for the pollution it causes, the externalities have not been built into the farming system. So if we as the public have to have for a lot of the problems that mm. farming has caused. I think the problem is around the word sustainable. So looking at how you measure what is sustainable is going to be so I like your idea that you look at what we can produce so from the land and then we reduce our consumption of certain things according to what the land will do. The problem is we've got so used to land producing more and more and much of that makes it really hard to produce some of those other public goods. Now the thing I'm interested in of course is biodiversity. You said at one point, oh, in the west of England or the west of Britain, well, uh, we're very good at producing grass and we're very good at producing grass fed meat. I think that's true, but we're doing that again, creating a lot of external factors. So ammonia is changing, for example, the uplands and nitrogen deposition, so you're seeing a lot yeah. less grass, yeah. a lot yeah. greater acidification, much more than you grow. And over the last 50 years, we have seen huge biodiversity loss. And this is because of the way we are farming. So right. I dispute the fact that we are doing a good job in meat production in the west of Britain. We are not. So there is one pair of green curly in the whole of the day. This is a farmland bird. This is not an island bird. So if we really want to deliver public goods, and we want some of those public goods to be biodiversity, we cannot go right. on producing food and meat in the way that we are at the moment. But so farmers right. are not evil people. Let me, let me just let me go back to take that because the, the main reason why we have lost the biodiversity of grasslands during my farming lifetime is life from first life. It's very, very simple. I've, I've been farming 45 years on our farm in West Wales. I've not used a kilogram of 
nitrogen fertilizers. And when you don't use nitrogen fertilizers, as we see going down this farm, what happens is that a lot of plants can coexist in the spore, even fairly intensively managed spore, that will completely be wiped out when you use nitrogen fertilizers. So what we need to do is part of the, the stick, which is the cap form, sorry, the Brexit, post Brexit, or even with cap, because cap's got to do this as well is we've got to tax nitrogen fertilizer in relation to the negative externalities that its use uh, causes. And the European Nitrogen Assessment has done an analysis of the business of, of how much, if you buy nitrogen fertilizer, this is cost of pounds a kilogram, something like that. The negative externalities arising from that same pounds spent are three pounds. So in other words, if you tax it, you the damage it does to nitrogen sulfide, to groundwater pollution and the damage to biodiversity and all the other things, bad things it does, you wipe out the business case for its use. So yes, it's true that the, the livestock farmers of waste have not been the best, the best way. And if you sorted out that nitrogen problem, you, you could reverse the biodiversity problems at scale, all over the, all over the UK and actually all over the world. fertilizer is a drug of choice. It's basically used by farmers all over the world because it pays. So we've got to make sure that it doesn't pay, not in a sort of majority of ways, but we've got to be honest with that. And all of a sudden, so that's your, that's your step, but the attack is to be rewarded on your biodiversity and it. And all your target back speed out to your county. And then all of a sudden you become very good at controlling the media um, or you know, encouraging the can I ask you a question way above my pay grade? <laughs> what happens in, the, in that transition period for farmers? Because the farmers that I deal with are by definition not well. And so I'm, I've spoken to many farmers who are beleaguered, they're not well, they're under pressure. So how do we make this easy for people to transition into this? Because it's not just simply a matter of stopping intensive agriculture and then all the butterflies come back. So what happens to people in that transition period? How do we make it easy? How do we support them? What carrots are built in? I think if you took away pillar one tomorrow, I think 80% of farmers would be unprofitable. Yes. That's right. Yeah. But I think that's where, that's where broad church is so important with what Richard's doing, engaging Tesco's in the supply chain, <coughs> and what we're doing in agroecology, and that we're not trying to just preach everyone needs to be organic tomorrow, but here's a few ideas to keep soil in your fields, or build fertility in your lays, or, or protect it, or reduce range of usage, or so on. Um, so I think it's it's not being preaching, and Richard's very keen not to, to this current farming systems because they've been pushed into that. that it, it's certainly not about farmers. Farmers are not bad people. They want the environment to be looked after and the biodiversity to improve hugely. It's Most policy and it's decades of policy. Yes. It's as simple as that. Very, very few farmers who wouldn't want to farm in a more nature-friendly way. They could make that Sorry. Profitable farming is about volume. Five tonnes of wheat to the acre with a hundred pounds with an acre of nitrogen, a hundred pounds with an acre agrochemical it pays money. Yep. And they, at the moment they're opting to go for the very intensive, let's produce more time style. In this country actually, it's very hard to get more intensive farmers to engage with us as organic farmers, but it's turning. Because of who I work for and where I work, and many times I've met with Patrick and we've met visitors from Europe and Australasia and America. All of these people have a much better relationship with their more intense <coughs> colleagues at home. So if it's a French farmer, a Dutch farmer, a German farmer, a Spanish one, they work very closely with their organic and more sustainable farming systems and they want to share knowledge. That's what agriculture is about. My title within agriculture is chairman of the steering group. And I don't get ever involved, these guys run it, but absolutely chair it. It's about practical farming solutions. It's about yes. telling people what did work and telling people about what didn't work. The only way we're going to change the use of artificial nitrogen is exactly what you're saying. You put it so eloquently, you know, why do not you do it and these taxes and so on, pulling these nitrogen uses out. And we will stop the decline in biodiversity, but it's not farmers. Don't ever 
don't blame the individual farmer. He's merely trying to keep his head above water, whether he's farming in the west of England in Wales or he's staying here on the fence. It's, he knows he has to have that mass production. So government and you guys and us, through demonstration, need to prove that there is a different way of doing it, but there's yes. going to be some pretty drastic change. And here. WWF, National Trust, you guys have got the members. So what you say about these things really, really matters because you've got more, you've probably got more inputs on government. You know, if Michael go or whoever has got cold feet about some of this stuff, particularly the election tax, for instance, mm. uh, then if, you know, enough <coughs> NGOs with big membership start to say, no, we need this because otherwise you can't get the farmers doing what they want to do. That's hugely important. I think one of the really interesting things what to do with that idea of farmers and farmers and energy as well. You cannot go like on that. They trust many people. Uh, at best, it's going to be another farmer. So the idea of you know, convening farmers to get to try and get us learning. Um, yeah, I mean, it just, it's, actually, it's, we forget, actually, learning is fun. And even if you're a believer, it's, it's quite good to get out and see something else in a good environment with friendly people who you might learn. And, we're all too busy to give ourselves that. So, so well, some years ago, when I was lucky enough to go to Prince of Wales, I ended up being on the on the contributors, shall I say, and on the communication and sharing with you and the press. Um, and also, I worked in France many years ago, and I worked with portages and farmers, and I worked with some pretty intensive. People to some very expensive people, but what was impressive to me was the way that people collaborated and learned and, um, and shared their um, ideas. Um, and so, just recently, the last um, two three years, we've, we've formed a, an innovation group of farmers and we've, we've deliberately gone to the environmental farmers outside the National Trust and we literally have a very nice coach. We drive around, we actually enjoy people's. Um, views and opinions, we don't agree with them all the time, but it's really, really helpful. And we're very lucky with this, this country to have been with the, um, the Nuffield Scholarship. But actually, you know, under a certain age, and putting it up three months of your, 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 your life, your busy life, you're going to do it. So actually, there's you know, a small subset of people get to do that. Then they come back and they might be putting things in practice. So actually, we work quite well with going to see some Nuffield scholars who come back and start doing what they learned about. And this is also very inexpensive to do in the budget of our You don't have to go to, to the US to see this at the moment. It's happening well and well in the UK, actually. So it's a question. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and these things, to my mind, are fascinating because the stuff that I was taught um, at, at, uh, at the University about farming are very different from what my current understanding is or more enlightened thinking. It's all, yeah, well, you would have said that then because that was fairly limited knowledge, but now that we understand that we're going to be a much more, uh, it's an overview as well, but holistic, we're going to be a bit more joined that way. Um, but it's just great to see things which actually work. And as, as, you know, um, we've got some farmers who are outside, they're cutting edge trying new techniques, but what's lovely is that they may not, they may still be in a bit of a bubble. So if they're able to put these up for a few years, give them reassurance that they're on the right way and actually makes sense. Um, and your question about how do you help people transition, it's going to be a lumpy ride for people who change. I mean, we all find change challenging, I'm sure. But where we can at least do by signposting, showing examples of where things do work, it's not just theoretical. It, it, that's pretty powerful. And I've seen some interesting change people you would have thought were fairly set in their ways who are prepared to be differently. Uh, I know people who have from Formula One cows, so the big coat hanger sort of pulse lines fed on soya and really head the hills and amazingly productive, which and people like that have actually decided, hmm, there's only as far as you can go, you've got a very fragile system, if it breaks, it breaks and it's spectacular passion. And there are there are people who are changing from that system to a more uh, less stressful system. You've got British Friesians here, haven't you, um, um, Richard? And, and others are using Friesian cross jerseys and um, genetics. Basically, smaller yielding cows, a lot more of them, and they're under a lot less stress. Their vectors are falling through the floor. They're not having to worry about that so much. And they're, 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 they lactate for you know, maybe eight, nine years without any problems. So it's a very different system. 
and they do tend to work. They're more resilient because they're not chasing the minute, they're chasing the overall cost. Um, and whilst we haven't got a nitrogen tax at the moment, just the penny has dropped. Well, actually, why am I spending so much money on spreading stuff, collecting? There are different ways to do farming, which actually, again, it's getting over the inertia of bigger is better. So what's the bottom line? What's the actual financial bottom line of the business? And we've got some, again, in North of England, fabulous example. Some of our really good farmers now, they were conventionally trained. There is very large cattle fed on sugar rich silage, which is about to travel a long way to get them. And there's a kind of job that actually I'm chasing my tails. I can't, I can't go any faster. And now getting into breeds which are actually slower growing, which can neutralize the forage which is right literally on the farm. Uh, is way more profitable and a lot less stress. What, what's, the, what's the current age of a farmer in this country? It's ridiculous, isn't it? It's like 60, 60, 60. Yeah. 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 And yeah. The most yeah. onerous yeah. and worrying part of being a farmer today is applying for subsidy and money. The window is just open for BPS applications, those of you who don't know, you know the single farm payment. It's absolutely terrifying. People are frightened of it, feel excluded, not included. And this new system needs to be inclusive and make something which is an enjoyable challenge for them to rise to. So we apply for our money, we have our stewardship schemes. Yes, we try and go our wildflowers and our strips and our boundaries and all these sorts of things. And then we're notified that we're going to be inspected by one of Her Majesty's inspectors. It's the money intimidating, uh, awful running process that they go through. They came here, they were here for three weeks, took about jobs worth, to tell me that I'm ploughing, you know, 10 centimetres too close to the hedge. Or, or but that's, that's the whole tyranny of the system mm -hmm. we've got, which is that we're, we're inspected to a ridiculous degree to do these things around the edge of bombs, which are destroying all the biodiversity. That's exactly so what right. we really need to do is to, is to support farming practices across the whole farm, yep. which is harmonious with biodiversity, and it is possible to produce food working harmony. It's just that the subsidies have driven it in the wrong direction. But I don't want to disagree with what you said, but the truth is that from a lot of farmers who have got niche markets or you know, who are not innovators or creative thinkers. If you're in a position of being a commodity state, yeah. um, which most farmers are, but we're just producing our crops at yes. or less than the cost of the production, markets are not properly rewarding us, then it's very hard to, you know, I mean, we're doing it because, you know, we're making cheese up on them. We've got an 80 power purpose, and we're way below the threshold of normal profitability. And because I'm privileged, and I've got a day job, and I've you know, got yeah. special markets, we're charging a high price for our cheese, and we're making it. But for most of us, they're not that position. So unless you get this eighty pounds a day, we get thirty thousand pounds a year from one percent of the just for farming. It's basically what it comes down to. With that money, if you said to all the farmers of England, you could only get that money next year if you change your farming practice, you put the whole of your ground, you build soil farming, you do all these other types of things. Most farmers will start to shake, and if you don't do that, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So this money is really critical. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know that, but the amount of optimism is we can get the people to worry about in space. It's a fantastic thing. People, I'm afraid, do live a lot of ways, and you don't want to be giving money away when you shouldn't be doing it. It's all our own money, fantastic. But on a positive note, there are some schemes, payment back schemes, which actually do show a much more positive relationship with with, um, with a sector that essentially isn't. Is a, is, a, is a subsequent. Um, and the most uh, inspiring uh, thing I've ever seen is actually over in, in the public island at County Clare, the Burren Life Center. Burren is a fabulous area of limestone taking, world heritage, renowned, spectacular. There are, you can't help but train on all kids to go for all kids. It's impressive. But it was under severe threat because it was beginning to become. Uh, more intensively managed, quite green grass, lots of nitrogen, and big continental cattle. And it was moving in a, in a direction where 20 years ago it was decided to, to, to hold it. And the scheme was, was devised, and the people who started it are still there now, and continuity pays a lot of things. And farmers are rewarded. The more they do, the more they get rewarded. And they self police. Uh, not all the time, but they largely self police. And I've met some of the most entertaining individuals who we think aren't the likely ones to go into this. You think, oh, this is going to be a hard sell. And I was like, 
skeptical that this will work. If you read about it, you think, what is it really like? So getting to speak to some of the farms involved was enlightening for me because they actually do compete with each other for form better because they have a little bit more. So rather than talk about how many tons of people have got, how many people have got, it's actually, well, I've mentioned this, this, and this, and I've got more uh, environmental like things than you have. And it's been more green, and it actually works. So we, on one of these trials, bits, we started up three years ago in Yorkshire to do a smaller version. And again, very encouraging, it's a small number of farmers, but they, again, they've done the same thing. And they are really pleased to work out what it is we're supposed to do. All these years, like the farmers, really, you've just got some, a menu, and if you don't deliver it, you, you know, you've got a you know, penalty. It's very different if you actually help engineer what you're supposed to be doing, and you then get why I'm so, doing something. And then you get people who, again, also get competitive about one thing to know what weeds are in your past, another thing to know what, um, what beneficial um, forms you've got in your past, and people are starting to trade these ideas. And one or a uh, farmer who I'm inviting to a workshop in a few weeks' time, again, he's really got into the soil structure. I mean, from a standing start with very low understanding, of well, I don't have erosion, therefore I don't have a problem, to now um, increasingly with more and more um, soil health. Um, some we literally do some big sort of stuff in structure and we have all the rest of it. And actually being really proud about it. And that was I mean the last time I went there, we had Manchester University doing some extra trials because he liked the idea. So it's just a change it really does change from conventional thinkers into less conventional thinkers, which is a good thing. So if we get it right, it has a huge difference. So your question about does Brexit give us more chances we wouldn't otherwise have? That's true. What we have to do is make sure we don't squander it. We do have to come up with something that isn't so laborious and it's just a big burden so that it's a big problem. Or, I oh know, I hate to say this in this company, but if, if we had a referendum and we decided to remain, the same issues are in the colleagues of the school. So these discussions are going process. There's a need for capital and we can have a big influence on that as well. So I can share that. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. How, how much is this um, from the subsidy? We've heard about say, what was it? Say eight pounds. About eight pounds an acre. Yeah, BPS. Yeah. How much is that subsidy you want to be taking to farmers? It's the net. Somebody just said this. If you look at most farmers' net farm income, it's, it's, the, it's what we get from pillar one and pillar two. Mm -hmm. So if you say you can't have that pillar one and pillar two money and you can change your practices, mm -hmm. most farmers will change. But what's the huge lever? Billion. From the government. Uh, uh, three, three billion. Three 2.8 billion, three billion. Mm -hmm. but, but there's a real mm -hmm. risk in terms of Brexit that the Treasury will say, Thank you very much. Look, what are we getting? What, what is the public getting for this 2.8 billion? Yes. Well, why, right. why can't we just give a billion or less? And, and cheap by the food. way, yeah. we're not that interested. We we're interested in cheap feeding food. people cheap. cheaply. Yes. And we can do that by lowering the tariffs and allowing lots of food in from other places. That's so there's a real do. battle between yes. DEFRA and the Treasury. Yeah. With DEFRA saying we want to maintain, and, and farmers arguing with DEFRA saying we want to maintain the quality of food production of animal welfare and of the environment in, in, British, in British farming. And the Treasury saying we want to, we don't want to increase the price of food and we fear that under some Brexit scenarios the price of food will radically increase. Um, Sorry? As, in, as people's incomes go down, potentially. As, as people's incomes go down. So there's a really challenging um, food and agricultural policy crunch to be worked through. But we're, much, that, we're much more likely to win that argument if we're, uh, we're applying it to the climate change debate. Yes. Well, you have to say that we're yes. building the soil yes. and the public health debate. Yes. The Treasury know how much they're spending on the NHS. Yes. If we could show through farming practice across the whole of the farm area, we're yep. improving public health and we're addressing climate change. Those are far more persuasive arguments. I entirely agree with you and that's why it's really important to have clear measures of that that are demonstrable to the Treasury in terms of the public benefit that's being yielded. And we've just done a piece on the public benefit and it's extremely difficult to account for the public benefit of biodiversity extremely difficult. It's much easier to account for the public benefit of carbon sequestration, for the public benefit of flood mitigation. Um, it, it's more difficult 
to make the connections between farming practice and public health. It's much well, more should, challenging should, because it's more about diet. We should than bring you into our metrics group because you know this is the, what we're struggling. We're, we're working for two and a half years on so trying to get the right metrics, which include health outcomes, and that's the hardest thing, as you just said. But this is we need to have a harmonised framework so we can measure and therefore manage the the public good outcomes. So, I, I'm going to have that to, needs uh, to go into the Treasury in the next six months about yeah. what we could get People can for the it. national benefit <laughs> from agriculture and food. We're going to have to. We're going to have to.